So we're going to continue our study of Luke today in uh, the first part of chapter 13. Um, I've always been a big Beatles fan. I don't know if there's any others out there, but uh, there's a song by them called We Can Work It Out. And there's a line that's repeated in that song a few times. It says, try to see it my way. Now, the song's actually about someone who's trying to convince someone else whom they love to try to see things their way before it's too late and their relationship is over. So today, as we discuss Luke 13, I want to take it one step beyond just, just telling you what the verses say, right? And try to consider what is really being said from God's perspective. See, I think often we get stuck on our own perspective on things, our own understanding, and we're not able to see it from the other person's perspective, <clears throat> which causes problems in the relationship. And it's basically the message of that song that I talked about. So God not, not only wants us to listen to him, but to try to see things from his perspective. And I guarantee you his is the right one. He wants us to try to see above our own human understanding and above the wisdom of the world, um, he wants, to see above, wants us to see above our pride and our passions, and by the power of his spirit, have his word and the mysteries of the kingdom and the riches of his glory opened up before us so that we can see him for who he truly is and see ourselves in our true relationship with him and thereby be changed forever. So why is that so important, right? Isn't it enough just to believe, to know that we're saved, we really need to understand all the details and the, and the deeper meanings of all the stories and the parables that we read in Scripture? Is it really that important to understand how God sees it? The answer is yes, of course. Uh, we don't all need to be Bible scholars, but we should be actively learning and growing in our knowledge of the Word because it enriches our lives, it strengthens our faith, prepares us for doing the Lord's work, and ultimately because it glorifies God. So to help make my point, I want to start with a few riddles. So put on your thinking caps. <clears throat> okay, number one. What comes once in a minute, twice in a moment, and never in a thousand years? What comes once in a minute, twice in a moment, and never in a thousand years? The letter M. <laughs> Second, <clears throat> a man gets into a terrible car accident. He's rushed into surgery, and the doctor says, oh, I cannot operate on this man. He's my son. But the doctor is not his father. How can that be? Well, you see, the doctor was his mother. Number three. If you're driving a bus from New York with ten people on it, and you stop in Pittsburgh, five people get off and seven people get on. Next, you stop in Chicago. Ten people get off. I'm sorry, I get, let me go back. I got it wrong. Uh, from New York with ten people. Stop in Pittsburgh. Five people get off. Seven people get on. Next, you stop in Chicago. Ten people get off, and five people get on. When you arrive at the station in St. Louis, the question is, what is the name of the bus driver? It was you, remember? You were driving a bus. From... Oh. Okay, no excuse on this next one. What is greater than God, more evil than the devil, the rich need it, the poor have it, and if you eat it, you'll die. Let me say that again a little slower. What is greater than God, more evil than the devil, <laughs> the rich need it, the poor have it, and if you eat it, you'll die. Nothing. Very good. Yeah. Hoping some people got up. <laughs> okay. okay, so now if you've never heard those riddles before, you might have still gotten one or two of them, right? Probably not all of them. But see, that's not because you're not smart enough, right? Uh, see, once I gave you the answers, you all got it, right? It made perfect sense once I gave the information. See, to the person telling the riddle, um, it seems so simple because they already know the answer, right? They're the one telling the story, and they have all the information and perspective in order to understand it. So in the first riddle about the letter M, people may not have even considered that I'm talking about the letters in the word. You're thinking about what happens within that period of time. Minute, moment, right? So it was your perspective that didn't let you see the answer. 
Um, in the second one, th there's a combination there of sort of cultural reality, which is most doctors are men, and the fact that I repeated the word man three times and he two times, but I didn't mention anything feminine at all. And see, that steers people's minds towards the male gender, and more times than not, people don't consider what they know to be true, which is that there are many great female doctors. Right? Again, it's a matter of perspective. Where is your mind at? Um, in the third one, most people will be so intent on making sure that they keep up with the math, right, that they just don't even consider um, you know, what the question actually was, which was the very beginning, the thing I started with. You're driving a bus. Why did you not know your name? Right? <laughs> and then in the last riddle, if you kept thinking after the first part, what is greater than God? Yeah, we should probably talk another time. <laughs> right? But in our minds, right, we just think we want to figure out the answer. We want to figure out the riddle. And we miss the obvious answer right at the beginning. Nothing is greater than God. Right? So it's often our human imperfection, our human weakness, our way of thinking that, that takes us away from the real thing that, that God is trying to teach us. Um, and by the way, if it makes you any feel bitter, I didn't get better. I didn't get any of those riddles the first time I heard them. So <laughs> if that's you, you're not alone. Um, there are numerous places throughout Scripture where it's not just the actions of the people that are being rebuked or corrected, but maybe more importantly, their thinking. Right? We do not uh, need, or we do need to continually try to correct bad things in our life in terms of behavior. But it's maybe a higher goal to change our minds and our hearts, turning them to God and His wisdom. Um, if, as believers, we need to be doing that, how much more do those who do not believe? whose eyes have not yet been opened, need to do the same thing. So we're going to go through a few sections of Luke 13 today and, talk, and look at how Jesus, in each instance, tries to do just that, turn our minds and hearts towards God in order to see things His way. Let me start with this question, though. Why don't we see things God's way? Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my way, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are brighter than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so the message that I want to share with you today uh, from Luke is that we all need to hear God saying to us, try to see it my way. So the first point I want to make is this. Um, I'm calling it, don't take your eye off the ball. Let's go ahead and read uh, Luke 13, verses 1 through 5. It says, there were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the, the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. <clears throat> now, Luke doesn't tell us directly if the people um, here had, or he doesn't tell us if the people had directly said that they thought it was because of their sin, or if Jesus simply knew their thoughts, which he can easily do. But either way, Jesus wanted to turn them from their own perspective to his. The people had thought that those tragic events were somehow related to their sinfulness. Jesus warns us that when we look at others as they experience suffering or tragic death and assume that it's somehow their fault because they were sinners, we make a few mistakes. First, we unfairly attribute a higher degree of sin to those people without any base in fact for doing so. Second, we incorrectly consider ourselves more righteous than those people because we didn't meet the same end, which can lead to a false sense that we're okay in God's eyes because he didn't punish us. And third, we wrongly assume that God meets out justice the same way and at the same time to all people. Now let's try to look at it in God's way. First, there may be some basis in Scripture for considering certain sins more severe than others. For instance, murder versus an unkind word. Okay. But that's really dangerous territory. Because you see, from God's perspective, sin is sin. 
He is a holy and righteous God who hates any sin. And he's a just God who must punish all sin. For the wages of sin is death, we read in Romans uh, 6.23. And that applies to all sin of any degree, whether in thought, word, or deed. So we need to try to stop comparing ourselves or our sin to other people's sin because all of us are heading for the same tragic end if we do not repeat, um, re- repent and accept Jesus as our Savior. So in this passage, Jesus is reminding uh, the people of that reality. Second point, when we see some um, uh, poor sinner that appears to be suffering God's judgment, right, and assume that we must be more righteous than them, we're not seeing it the way God does. See, that's just human pride and judgment. And it's also really dangerous ground. In Romans 3, 11 and 12 says, None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. I think that makes it pretty clear that we have no righteousness of our own. So we should never think of ourselves as more righteous than anyone else. Third, we don't think about the how and the when as God does when it comes to dispensing judgment. When we see an judgment, uh, when we see an injustice, we tend to think that it must be dealt with right away. Right? We want to see the bad guy caught, tried, convicted, locked up, and the key thrown away right away. Right? See, that's not how God sees it. He is just, but he's also patient. As we're going to see in the next passage from Luke, he does not deal with sin the same way and in the same time in all circumstances. Let's consider the story of Moses and the exodus from Egypt. So how would that story have gone if the first time Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, and Pharaoh said no, God just struck him dead? Well, now, I'm pretty sure that's what the people in Israel at the time (laughs) was wishing was going to happen, right? That's how they saw it. That's what should have happened, right? Uh, Maybe even Moses felt the same way. But either way, in the end, Pharaoh would have been defeated. But the Lord had another purpose in mind, which was to reveal himself as a mighty king with power to defeat all of his enemies, but also as a sovereign but benevolent Lord, full of love towards his people and one who always keeps his promises. He showed this through the many signs and miracles that they experienced. He showed his power and his restraint. He showed his justice and his compassion. And think of what that story has meant to all of us here, and what it has meant in the lives of believers for thousands of years since. So the next thing I want to do here is to consider those same events in terms of how it applies to us collectively and personally. So collectively, Jesus was likely warning the people of Israel about the destruction of Jerusalem that was prophesied to occur only generations after he was telling this, or after he was saying these things. When Rome would come in and destroy the city of Jerusalem, the people's refusal to accept Jesus as the Messiah would ultimately lead to their destruction, right? As a nation. But individually, he's also warning them of their own pending doom if they do not repent and be born again. He was leveling the field by asserting that they were all sinners, they will all face death because of their sin, and they will all stand before God, before the judgment seat of God. If they did not repent, they would face a far greater destruction than what was told of the Galileans who died in the temple and those in Jerusalem who died under the tower. Jesus told the people in both instances that they would also perish if they did not repent. Now, I think it's noteworthy to point out that in these two instances where Jesus says to repent, the Greek uses a slightly different word or a slightly different form of the word. Uh, The first time when talking about those that were killed in the temple by Pilate while making sacrifices, the word refers more to the idea of once and for all repentance, that type of repentance that that John and Jesus invited us um, to, to do in our lives. The second time, when he was talking about the tower falling and killing those 18 people, he's using a slightly different word to refer to uh, the idea of continual repentance. Um, So this would apply more to to us as believers and the fact that we should always be in a state of repentance. 
um, in recognition of our persistent sinful nature. Um, This seems important to point out so that we don't mistakenly think that Jesus here is only speaking to those non-believers and not us. So as typical for all of us, we tend to think about things our own way and we make incorrect assumptions. We're quick to judge others and quick to exalt ourselves. But Jesus wants us to keep our eye on the ball. And in this case, the ball is the reality that we have all sinned. We all need to repent and that always and, and then always remain repentant if we do not wish to perish but be with the Lord. Second point I want to make um, is don't jump to conclusions. So let's now read Luke 13, 6 through 9. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, Sir, let it alone this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Now from a human perspective, you could try to make the case that it was the vine dresser that was the good guy in this story. The owner of the vineyard who came looking for fruit was just ready to cut the tree down since there was none. It was the vine dresser that tried to save it. But keep in mind that it doesn't say whether the tree ever bore fruit or whether it was ultimately cut down. That's left to the reader. Now, it's not unusual for people to think of God as mean or unjust because they read in the Old Testament about the wrath of God. I read someone's comment recently um, that, that said that he couldn't believe in a God that killed more people than Hitler. Now, I get the point, but that point is made out of ignorance. He simply doesn't know God. And he jumped to a conclusion based on only part of the facts. So let's try to look at this uh, parable from God's perspective. First, it was the owner's tree. It was his vineyard, not not the vine dressers. He was free to plant it and free to cut it down, regardless of whether there was fruit. But the fact that the tree was planted in a vineyard tells us that the intent was that it should have received the very best of care. The owner wanted there to be every opportunity for it to bear fruit. Now, it was his money that would have paid for the land and for the wages of the vine dresser, both of which would be wasted if no fruit was produced. And that money and that same amount of time and effort could have been used for something else that would produce fruit. We also don't know if the Lord agreed to allow the vine dresser to work with the tree for one more year. But if the owner represents the Lord, I think it's safe to assume that maybe he did because he continuously shows his patience while only on occasion displaying his justice in order to remind us that justice is inevitable. But either way, God is trying to get us to look at ourselves and ask, are we bearing fruit? If not, then we need to repent as we learned in the previous passage. But we also need to repent now. You see, we can't afford to wait until next year. We don't know if there's going to be a next year. The truly wicked will never repent. The only ones who will bear good fruit are those who are in Christ, who is the vine, and the source of all good works that he works through us, who are the branches. He's helping us to remember that while he is patient, There is no advantage to putting off our repentance and acceptance of God's free gift of grace. Those who will not accept Christ are simply putting off the inevitable. And as it says in Romans 2, treasuring up to themselves the wrath of God against the last day. Now we tend to think of some people as good, some people as bad. And we, we tend to think that only, it's only right that good people or that good things happen to good people and that bad things happen to bad people. But that's not how God sees it. See, all those that do not bear fruit will be cut down. And that fruit isn't our goodness. The fruit is the evidence of God's goodness in us. It manifests itself only when we are born again and the Spirit of God dwells within us. In Galatians 5, and 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, 
joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Do we have those fruits in our lives? The vine dresser asked the owner of the vineyard to give him time to see if he could get the tree to bear fruit. He offered to dig around it and put in manure to fertilize it. Now, most of us uh, consider manure as something that should be hauled away. It smells bad. It looks disgusting. We want it as far away from us as possible, right? A farmer, however, will drive for miles to fill up the back of their truck till overflowing in order to bring back this load of precious material that will turn a barren field into a lush green harvest. We should hope for the Spirit of God to dig around us, mixing in a little manure here and there in order to fertilize our souls so that we might bear fruit. And if that means that life gets a little smelly and dirty now and then, so be it if the result is eternal life. Um, the third point I want to make, um, I'm saying, I'm, I'm calling God's law is for us, not against us. So let's read Luke 13, 10 through 17. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight. And she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. What was it that brought certain Jews to the point that they, were cons they would consider it wrong to heal someone on Sabbath? See, through the years, it was their own thinking, their own perspective on the law that gradually overshadowed the true meaning of the Sabbath and the law in general. Now, what did Jesus do in this story? Heal someone? Well, yes. But remember that what was said. It said that she had a disabling spirit for 18 years. It doesn't say she had a back problem. She had a Satan problem. And Jesus freed her from it. This is not to say that she was possessed. She may very well have already been a believer in Jesus. From what I can surmise from my study on this, it seems generally accepted that while a truly regenerated person can't be possessed by demons, since God's spirit dwells within them, a believer can be under the influence of demons, such that they can cause certain types of disease and other suffering. Consider the story of Job. I think it's safe to say he was a believer. But his illness was not something natural like a cold or a flu. He suffered from the influence of Satan, who was allowed to test Job by causing supernatural things to afflict his body. Is it wrong to save people from the grasp of demonic influence just because it's the Sabbath? When we see it from God's perspective, you might say it's the best day of the week to do it. See, every Sunday in churches across the world, people are invited to come and ask Jesus to heal them spiritually, to save them from the disabling chains of sin and the snare of Satan's temptations. Do any of us think that's wrong? Somehow the ruler of the synagogue and those that sided with him believed that it was okay to loose an ox or a donkey in order to allow it to drink, but, to, but not to loose a daughter of Abraham from Satan's grip. So what, after all, is the purpose of the law? In part, it's a way to contrast man with God. The law makes clear the perfect and righteous nature of God 
while highlighting our sinfulness. This contrast serves to drive us as sinners to Jesus, as well as restrain the unlawful to some degree. It also helps us to know what is pleasing to God. And our efforts to adhere to his law and to delight in it shows our love for him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But in the end, the purpose of the law is simply to, to, to glorify God. Would it have helped to glorify God if Jesus simply ignored the woman and let her continue in her suffering? Would it have been any more glorious if he waited a day or two and did it on Tuesday? Certainly not. Now, there, are, there were two distinct categories of response to Jesus' rebuke of the ruler of the synagogue. The ruler of the synagogue who's, who had, and those who sided with him hung their heads in shame because see, they had not seen things from God's perspective. The people who were glorifying God and continued rejoicing uh, after his rebuke, they were likely the believers in the crowd. And they saw Jesus' actions for what they were, not breaking the law, but an act of mercy by the one who would satisfy it. They were the ones that saw it God's way. And in closing, um, it's thought that Luke wrote his gospel primarily to the Gentiles. And the message was often focused on certain Jews as a way to see how a highly religious, hard-hearted people who ultimately rejected the Messiah that they had waited so long for, could literally look God in the face and not see him for who he was, not understand what he was teaching, and think that what they had was better than what he offered. They'd spent too many years building a religious enterprise according to their understanding of the law and purposes of God, so that even when God, in the case of Jesus healing this woman on the Sabbath, as Calvin put it, made his glory to shine with peculiar brightness in those blessings which are more remarkable. They simply didn't see it for what it was because they didn't see it his way. A young child can fully un or cannot fully understand us as parents. But as we spend more and more time with them, they come to know us through our words, our actions, and perhaps best by how we love them. In the same way, we should come to better understand our God. We need to spend more time with him in prayer, the study of the word, and we need to get to know him by observing and considering how he loves us. And the better we come to know him, the better we can see it his way.